In our first study together, we looked at the living the blessed life of Christ, and we saw that we have uh, future blessings in Christ, we have eternal blessings in Christ, but there are also many blessings that we can lay hold of now. Um, the Lord doesn't force himself upon us, but they're there, he, they're there with him in heaven, and he's willing to dispense them to us as we go on with him in faith and trust him. And so we saw the, the lovely tie between the book of Joshua and the book of Ephesians. Uh, for Israel, uh, it was a land of rest that they, they desired. And as they went on with Joshua in conquering, um, they laid hold of their inheritance. They got their possession from the Lord and they entered his rest. It's the same in the New Testament. We go on with the Lord. Uh, we rely on him in conquest. We battle against spiritual wickedness in high places, and we lay hold of our spiritual possessions in heavenly places in Christ. And we enter deeper and deeper into God's rest. We have, um, we saw in Hebrews four, 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 types four types of rest, the rest of salvation, when we cease for working uh, to earn God's favor and just rest in the finished work of Christ alone. We saw then there was a Cana rest when we go on with him in faith, increasing our borders, so to speak, uh, being able to lay hold of spiritual blessings in heavenly places, practically experiencing the Lord, growing in our faith, trusting him more and more. And then we're waiting to enter in our final rest, which is heaven. And we saw some wrong attitudes concerning uh, our possessions that the Lord gives us. We might say, oh, well, um, this is not enough. Uh, and the whole time we're just, we don't want to engage in a work or it's too hard. Uh, we know it's going to take a long time. I've had several experiences like that through my Christian life. And yet when we come to the end of ourselves and just yield, God always blesses. And then there's the thought of, oh, it's too much that we need to realize that God knows exactly what gifts are needed and who needs to come alongside and help us in the work. And if we just trust in him, he does it. And we've seen it happen over and over again as well. And then there's always consequences for not staying, uh, doing God's best, not staying in his will. Uh, he's for us. There's consequences to sin. We choose our sin. God chooses our consequences. But um, failures are not final unless we make them so. The Lord wants us to learn from our mistakes, get up in grace and go. The righteous man falls seven times but the wicked and gets rises again, but the wicked fall into mischief. So again, it's um, when we do fall, we just tell the Lord we're sorry, um, um, ask for forgiveness, learn from it, get up in grace and go on. But it's not cause to um, regress in our own thinking and settle for something less than what God wants us to have. In the second session that I have, I would like to think with you about how do we obtain blessings in Christ now? And we're going back to the book of Joshua. I want to look at two key figures in the book, Joshua and Caleb. And we see uh, really the same process uh, there's four main ingredients that were involved with each of these men's lives that um, allowed them to gain the possession that God had for them and enter into his peace. So let's turn to Joshua chapter 14. We're going to look at Caleb first. I mentioned in the last session that um, there were, Josephus says that there were two urns. And uh, Joshua and the high priest Eleazar um, are, are there. There's tribal names in one urn. There's borders and uh, possessions in the others. And so they, they would draw from the urns both the, the possession and the tribe. And um, so they knew that God was uh, controlling it. Proverbs 16.33, this is Old Testament reality where God would use the, the lot to show his approval on things. Um, they also had the, the two priestly stones in the breastplate for the high priest ephod, the Urim and Thummim that would also uh, give God's direction. And so they knew that this was the, 
the, the inheritances that each tribe got, they knew this is what God wanted them to have. It was their best for them. It was his providential care for them. We're going to pick up in verse 5 now. It says, And the Lord had commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephua, the Kinzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me at Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where you, your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, here I am, this day, 85 years old. As yet, I am as strong this day as one as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both from going out and for coming in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day, for you have heard in that day how Anakim were there, and the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him, and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Well, you got to love Caleb. He and Joshua were two of the twelve, 12 spies, uh, one from each tribe that went into uh, Cana to spy out the land, and apparently. Caleb, uh, he was spying out the, the hill of Hebron in that surrounding area. And he came back, and Joshua came back. Um, well, actually, all the, the spies agreed that God had given them a land that was rich, full of milk and honey. But the ten spies talked the people out of, it, of going in and seizing it because there were fortifications and giants in the land. They said, oh, we'll just be like grasshoppers before them. But Caleb and Joshua wanted the people to go on with the Lord, go in and, and seize their possession. And we know the story. Um, that generation, for the next 39 years, their corpses dropped in the wilderness until all the, the generation... Uh, that were 20 years old and older had perished. And so the Lord brought a new generation in. Only Joshua and uh, Caleb were the old timers that were allowed to come in. So um, you've had the years of wandering, you've had the conquest, and now Caleb's 85 years of age. And they're distributing the allotments and, of course, Judah gets this big southern area. And guess what? Uh, Caleb's of the tribe of Judah. And he's already been promised Hebron. So, obviously, the tribe of Judah had to get the southern portion of Canaan. And so, it was obvious, again, that um, this was providential uh, dispersion of the inheritance uh, for, by God for his people. And the Caleb's inheritance, being in the tribe of Judah, was right where it was supposed to be. So Caleb reminds Joshua and says, this is what Moses told me. Uh, I've wholly followed the Lord. It says that three times in this passage. And um, so he was rewarded for his faithfulness. Now, <clears throat> what determined the particular possession that Caleb would receive, which was um, the city of Hebron, which was on a hill, 
And by the way, it hadn't been completely conquered. There were still giants in the city. It was still a fortification. So the surrounding area had been conquered, but there was a stronghold there that was held by giants. Caleb says, give me my mountain. Give me my inheritance. I'm as strong this day as I was when I was 40. Now, when an 85-year-old says that to you, you might think, well, that's maybe there's an onset of dementia or something like that. But that wasn't the case with Caleb. He was a man of faith. And he was serious about his possession that the Lord had given him. And he wanted it. Possession. And so, obviously, there is obedience in this matter of getting our possession. That's, that's a given. But there are four main qualities that seem to... Uh, be factors in the inheritance that, that Caleb received from the Lord. First of all, he was willing to engage in conflict, uh, conflict to get it. He'd been uh, in conquest for years in Cana. The conquest lasted about seven years. And he had been in the battle, uh, helping his brethren get their inheritances, their possessions. And now that the lamb was being distributed, he wanted to go on with the Lord. And he wanted his possession, Hebron. Give me my mountain. And so uh, he's willing to engage in conflict to get it, to go on with the Lord. Verse 12. Um, he's accepted God's providence in the matter. The lot determined where Judah was going to get their portion and, and Caleb's portion already promised him was right smack in the middle of it. And uh, he was claiming God's word and... Um, he wanted his possession. He asked for it in verse 12. Give me my mountain. And then the fourth thing is his capacity to bless others. And this seems to be a big factor in the possessions, the blessings we get from the Lord. Are we willing to use them to bless others? We might be willing to gauge in conflict. We might understand that God is in control and providence. He gives us what we need. And we're willing to ask um, him, not satisfied with who we're at, but asking for more. We'll talk about that in a minute. But do we have the idea that everything we have is from the Lord and is not for us, but for the edification of the body of Christ? You know, Paul reminded the um, saints at Corinth, what do you have that you didn't receive? And the answer is nothing. And we read in the book of Ephesians in chapter 4 that we have a, each believer has a work of ministry to do in building up the body of Christ. So on this last point, I'd like you to um, look at what happened to Caleb's uh, inheritance. First of so all, Caleb receives his inheritance in Joshua chapter 14. And then in Joshua chapter 15, we read that... Uh, Caleb didn't have dementia. He was strong in the Lord, just as he was when he was 40 years of age. And so Joshua is recording the boundaries for the tribe of Judah. And we read in verse 13, Now to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave a share among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kirath Arba, which is Hebron. Arba was the father of Anak, and uh, this was the family of giants. What did Caleb do? Verse 14, Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak from there. And then their names are given. It says, verse 15, then he went up from there to the inhabitants of Deber, formerly named of Deber, Kirath Sefer. And Caleb said, he who attacks Kirath Sefer and takes it to him. I will give Aksha my daughter as wife. So Othnel, you might remember his name. He's one of the first judges in the book of Judges. The son of Kinaz, the brother of Caleb, took it, and he gave him Aksha his daughter as wife. Now it was so when she came to him that she persuaded him to ask her father for a field. So she dismounted from her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you wish? So before she could even speak, Dad asked her, What do you want? Verse 19, she answered, Give me a blessing, since you have given me land in the south. 
give me also springs of water. So he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Is a really lovely story, isn't it? So we have um, Othniel, and uh, he gets this challenge from Caleb. If, if you will take Kiras Sefer, I'll give you my daughter's hand in marriage. And he takes it, and he gets her. And uh, there was a portion of land that came along with that. And it was a good land, portion of land, but we see that Aksha, uh, after discussing with her husband, comes to her father, and she's going to ask for the upper and lower springs around the land, which would make it much more valuable. Uh, it's very lovely in that before she can say a word, Caleb says, what would you like? And so she asks, and Caleb immediately gives it to her. So we see this uh, giving spirit of Caleb with his possession. He's the one who's leading the charge. He's the one who's facing the giants, taking the fortifications, taking the what is his, what God has given him. And yet he's turning around and blessing others with it. And we also read in chapter 21, verse 13, that Hebron became one of the priestly cities. And we don't have this conversation recorded in scripture, but I wonder if the two old timers, Joshua and Caleb, had a little discussion about this. And Joshua came to Caleb and said, you know, Caleb, I'm just wondering, um, Hebron, you know, that, that land that you took away from the giants and you fought for, I'm just wondering if you would want to use that possession that you've been given by God for a priestly city so that if anybody would have a question about God's word, they could come to your possession in Hebron and have it answered. And I think Caleb would have said, yes, I, I like to use my possession for that. So the word of God be made known among his people. And then we also read in chapter 20, verse seven of the book of Joshua that they uh, Hebron became one of the six cities of refuge and uh, one of only three in Cana proper. And perhaps again, Joshua and Caleb had a conversation and, and Joshua looked at his friend Caleb and said, you know, Caleb, I'm just wondering if, if you would like to use this possession that you've gotten in Hebron that you fought for and that you drove the giants out of, if, if you might want to use that for a city of refuge. So that someone who's um, accidentally killed someone, uh, they could flee to your inheritance and they would be protected until they could have a safe trial and justice could be upheld. And you would save them from the avenger of blood. And I think Caleb said, yeah, I'd like to do that. If I could be a help to other people and save lives, I would be glad to use my possession for that. And so he had a great attitude about using his possessions, uh, not for his own hoarding or his own prestige or stature, but to bless others. And this is what the Lord wants us to do with our spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He wants us to lay hold of them by faith. He wants us to ask uh, for them. They're given in providence uh, to us according to God's sovereign will. We understand that. Um, but he is a big God, and he wants us to ask big. You probably heard the story of Napoleon. There was a, a young officer, I think a second lieutenant, who came to Napoleon and asked for a large inheritance over an area that had just been conquered. It ended up being the soldier's um, homeland in years past. And uh, Napoleon didn't even think about it. He just granted the request. Uh, this stunned his other officers, and later one of his senior officers asked him, why did you grant that young man his huge request? And Napoleon said this, he honored me by the magnitude of his request. And we honor the Lord by the magnitude of our requests. Understanding that we're not praying for ourselves, we're praying that we might be used as a conduit of blessing to bless others. John Newton put it this way in a lovely uh, stanza of a hymn. Thou art coming to a king, 
large petitions with you bring, for his grace and power are such, none can ask too much. We honor the Lord by asking big requests. Both Caleb and Joshua, as we'll see in a few minutes, ask the Lord for their possessions. And we too can ask the Lord for our heavenly possessions in Christ, in the heavenly places, not for our own profitability, but for the good of others. Um, let's look to Joshua now for another example. And this is in Joshua chapter 19. And we'll pick up in verse 49, Joshua 19, 49. When they had made an end of dividing the land as an inheritance according to their borders, the children of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua, the son of Nun. According to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city which he asked for, Timnah. Sura, in the mountains of Ephraim, and he built the city and dwelt in it. Joshua is uh, well over a hundred years of age. Um, he will uh, die at the end of the book. He's 110, but he's over a hundred years of age. He's made sure that everyone else has come into their inheritance. They've, they've got their possession. And then we see, as they made an end to the dividing the land, that's when Joshua gets his inheritance. Um, boy, what a great example. It, it really shows us um, there's no me first attitude in leadership. Um, Joshua was a shepherd, it's the sheep first. And he was willing to go last to make sure everybody else got came into the good of God's promises. Now, it says that uh, he was given an inheritance, and it's going to be the city of Timna. Uh, this would be southwest of Shiloh, about 11 miles. Uh, it wasn't a particularly good land. It was, uh, again, there was this rugged hill country, um, some barrenness, and uh, that was Joshua's um, inheritance. So if we're looking at, uh, like Caleb, Joshua obviously was obedient to the Lord. He finished the work in verse 49. And then we see these same four ingredients that viewed in Caleb's, getting, uh, Caleb getting his possession, we see these same four aspects of determining Joshua's possession. It says in verse 50, according to the word of the Lord. That's providence. That's uh, the sovereign care of God uh, in giving the possession. We've already seen that he was willing to gave, uh, engage in conflict. Uh, he led the Israelites for seven years in warfare. And he asked for his inheritance in verse 50. And then at the end of the verse, it says he built the city and dwelt in it. Now, keep in mind, Joshua is over 100 years of age. And if there was anybody that could withdraw on their 401ks or cash in some IRAs, it was, it was Joshua. He had done his time, right? Sometimes we get that idea, oh, man, I've done my time. You know, we just think that for the rest of the lives, we can somehow take a vacation in the, in the Lord's work. And we really don't see that in Scripture. Um, the men that God used in Scripture kept their vitality right up to the end until God took them home. And that's quite evident in Joshua and Caleb. But I love this. Here's a hundred-year-old man. He's going to be with the Lord pretty soon. I should say he's he's going to go to the grave. He'll be with the Lord eventually. But um, he is intent on building up his possession for the good of others. He wants to have a city that will be available for generations to come to be blessed by. Probably about 15 years ago, I was um, down in the southeast part of the country for a conference and a uh, particular 
church put me up in the apartment that was attached to the church building. And they said that one of the elders would be coming by to pick me up for, for dinner. And um, that evening, one of the elders came by and he picked me up for dinner. And uh, as we were going out to the restaurant, um, I asked him what he had been doing that day. And uh, this man was 91 years of age. And he looked at me and says, well, I've been planting fruit trees today. And I'm thinking... That is hard work for a 91-year-old man. That's hard work for even a younger man, digging holes, planting trees. But that's what he'd been doing. I doubt whether that man ever got one piece of fruit off of those trees. But he's not thinking of himself. He's thinking about blessing the next generation. And that is a great attitude to have. We understand that our spiritual blessings in heavenly places we can lay hold of them and experience God on a higher plane than we are today. But it's not for our um, increased inheritance just so we can boast or say we have this or that in Christ. The whole idea is to lay hold of our spiritual blessings that he might be glorified in his church and that the church might be built up and edified through us. And if all of us had this idea of how we could help um, preserve and pass along the blessing to the next generation, the body of Christ would be so much healthier today than it is. So these qualities of uh, these four things, willing to engage in conflict, understanding that God has a providence in bestowing the possessions, the blessings that we receive, a willingness to ask the Lord, and also the capacity to bless others. Now, as we carry this into the New Testament, I want to just ask the question, what about you? Are you willing to go on in obedience with the Lord, no matter what the cost? The Lord looked at his disciples in Luke 6, 46, and he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I say? If he's Lord, then we have to obey him. In John 14, 15, the Lord said, If you love me, obey my commandments. Obedience is a practical demonstration that we love the Lord. Are we willing to confront spiritual wickedness in high places? In Ephesians 1, uh, sorry, Ephesians 5, 11, uh, Paul says, don't have fellowship with things that are, are wicked and the darkness that's in the world, but rather by a life, reprove them. It's not just being... Uh, we're not to be silent in a world that's wicked. We're to have a life that shows forth the truth and reproves such things. Um, silence endorses sin. And uh, we're not to have lives that are silent. We have lives that should be showing the truth. And then are we willing to ask? Um, in John chapter 14, verse 13, the Lord's promise, if you ask my father anything in my name, I will do it. James 4, 2 tells us that often we don't have because we don't ask. Are we willing to ask? Are we willing to ask big to see the Lord do uh, big things in our lives? And then we understand that there is this, this providential aspect in the blessings and the work that God has for us. We read that in Ephesians 2, 10, that he has foreordained these uh, good works for us to walk in. And uh, he doesn't force us. And I think that's why he told the church at Philadelphia, don't let anyone steal your crown. If uh, we balk at what God wants us to do, he'll use somebody else, and then they'll get the reward we could. But are we, are we willing to walk in the good of what God has for us? Pretty incredible that he saved us, redeemed us, given us this great inheritance, and then he gives us things that we can do to please him, show him that we love him. And then lastly, are we willing to bless others with what we've received? I referenced Ephesians 4.12 earlier. We all have a work of ministry to do within the body of Christ. Every believer has a spiritual gift or gifts and a calling and a work to do in the body. And we need each other. And so we need to have this attitude that I am here to serve the Lord and bless others in the body of Christ that the body might be built up. 
Well, may we all go on with the Lord in faith to enter into his cane of rest. Then we will be able to stand fast in the faith and enjoy his presence during our earthly sojourn. I pray that these sessions have been helpful in thinking about um, what could be and getting beyond where we are today, not living uh, like the, the little elephant that's trained in his mind that he can't do more than what, what he can. Uh, we need to be liberated uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ, laying hold of these spiritual blessings in heavenly places and seeing the hand of God in ways that we aren't seeing today. Uh, we need to, to revive life. We need the Lord's presence. And if we do that, we'll stand fast in the faith. I just want to close by showing you a picture that's on the wall of my office. Uh, our serene rest is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love this picture of the shepherd uh, embracing a lamb. The lamb just nuzzled up right to his cheek. And uh, it's just the epitome of rest. And that's what the Lord has for us. He won't force us into his rest. But I really believe that all beneficial spiritual exercise begins when we rest in high places with the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you again uh, for this study. We pray that you would um, bring us closer to yourself. We pray that whatever is hindering us from being liberated to serve you with, with uh, full tenacity, in the power of your spirit would be removed, whether it's wrong attitudes, whether it's sinful bents, whether it's ignorance of the truth, uh, Father, disobedience, whatever it is, we pray that you would remove it. Lord, we need you. We need your rest. We need your peace. And we pray, Father, that we would become more than we are today uh, for the benefit of the body of Christ and for your honor and glory. We ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.